The time had come for the armed forces of the Federated Sons to launch their attack on the heavily defended DCMS command bases on Dahar and Robinson. In March 2814, a warship squadron was dispatched to each system to clear the path for the ground invasions. Only a single ancient vessel moved to oppose them at Dahar, no match for the trio of Davian ships arriving, but the nuclear arsenal it carried meant that it would drag two of them down into the abyss along with it. After that, the surface battle proved to be a complete anticlimax. Despite fearing a large fortified garrison, the Combine had actually withdrawn most of its forces before they could be cut off. A brief skirmish outside the capital city was enough to reclaim Dahar. The same was not true for Robinson, capital of the entire Draconis March. As before, the Federated Sun's Navy dispatched a trio of vessels to take control of the space lanes, facing off with two of the Draconis Combine Admiralty's few remaining warships including what was once the flagship of the DCA's now extinct second fleet. The two command ships engaged each other while the destroyers paired off and the aerospace fighters entered into a melee of their own. Hanging back until all others are committed were three squadrons of land air mechs. When an opportunity presented itself, they rushed the new Samarkand and boarded the carrier after transitioning into battle mech form. The experienced crew on board was one of the finest remaining in service to Kirita, but were powerless to stop such a heavy assault force. The warship detonated minutes later, taking many of the boarding team with it. Soon after, the last of the Combine's naval defence was destroyed, at which point Marshal Holder Davian ordered his task force to begin landing procedures. At least two DCMS regiments were reported on planet, split between the major cities. An overwhelming AWFS task force swept through the Battlemech defences within a week, but the infantry had gone to ground inside the residential districts, forcing a protracted struggle to root out the last of them, during which time several chemical weapons were used, poisoning the waterways. By sheer coincidence, the attack on Robinson coincided with a prison break staged by the cadets of the planet's military academy. The Draconis March capital had fallen so long ago that the survivors were now in their 40s. They took control of the prison facility's anti-air emplacements just as Holder Davian was coming under fire from the Curitan fighters outside the complex, helping to sway the battle in the AWFS's favour. By May, both Dahar and Robinson were securely under Federated Sun's control. Paul Davian had to decide how much further he wanted to push his luck. His troops, still buoyed by the successive victories they had achieved, were nevertheless reaching a point of exhaustion. They could not maintain the speed of their earlier advance. With that in mind, he stretched out his time plan and withdrew what he could for recuperation in safer regions. He also moved troops to the Capellan border, who were once again nibbling at the Chesterton Welds, taking Farwell after a brief one-month battle in June. The counter-offensive began again towards the end of the year. In the last two months of 2814, the AWFS made landfall on Glenmora, Clathandu and Sakara. Like the cadets on Robinson, those Sakara Academy students who had taken up arms had to wait almost three decades to see their home liberated. At Clathandu, Curitan warships unleashed a devastating orbital barrage on the ground forces below prompting a nuclear exchange between the two commanders. The planet would survive, but it was one of the lowest points of the campaign for Davian. The year had gone poorly for the Free Worlds League. A raid on Holt by the Chevaux Leger had resulted in the complete destruction of the Green Orloff Grenadiers in Garrison, but worse was to follow in 2815. An extremely virulent bioweapon was unleashed on the planet Jardine by unknown forces. The world was home to some 40 or 50 million, but Thaddeus Maddock was forced to enact a complete quarantine or risk having the bioagent spread beyond the system, leaving the inhabitants to their sad fate. Nearby, the Lyran High Command began what would be only their second major offensive of the Succession Wars, Operation Spiderweb. The brainchild of Hauptmann General Ranier Hogarth, the goal was to push the Free Worlds League out of the Solaris Bulge and take for themselves the economic powerhouses of Kalidasa and the game world Solaris itself. 
Two task groups were organised on either side of the region, each comprising a trio of regulars and one of the Elysian Lancers regiments. The operation commenced in February, with the dual assaults on Uhuru and Wing. Hogarth's campaign was slow and deliberate, about the only strategy the LCAF was capable of at that point in the war, but it was nonetheless successful. The massively outnumbered FWLM garrisons could not hope to match them. With victory achieved, they waited for conventional reinforcements to arrive before departing to their next targets. 2815 saw only limited action along the Federated Suns border. Between March and October, the Federated Suns took back Breed, Royal and Talmadge. To help reinforce their struggling defensive line, Kirita hired on the Paul Bunyan Regiment of mixed AEAF and SLDF vintage. The collapse of the Combine's invasion was having a distinct impact on the Kiritan officer corps. The veterans were dropping like flies. Many were so ashamed by their inability to hold the aid of Laves that they decided to commit seppuku. It became an endemic problem for the DCMS, to the point where Jinjiro Kirita was forced to step in and outlaw the practice completely. He also had to reel in his own brutalistic treatment of those who failed him, as the number of qualified commanders continued to dwindle. This was both a blessing and a curse for the Fed Sons. The replacement officers were young green cadets straight out of school. While they lacked experience, they did not feel the same shame their predecessors did regarding the Kintari massacre, and so fought with renewed vigour. One of the strangest curiosities to come out of 2815 occurred within the Capellan Confederation. Bordering the Chesterton commonality was the planet Westphalia, garrisoned by a regiment of their voltigeurs. It was close enough to the front that they could expect trouble, but otherwise of little strategic importance. When a raiding party did arrive, it did so from an entirely unexpected source. Freeman's fanatics were mercenaries employed by Haus Steiner, the exact reason for such a deep strike is lost to history, with some speculating it was either an attempt to recover information found by a Lyran agent, or perhaps the fallout of a failed alliance between the Commonwealth and Confederation. In early 2816, the Bella system once again became the site of a battle between Marek and Steiner. The Lyran regulars, who had retreated so ingloriously, were now returning. They had spent the last two years training under Raymond Hempstead, the former colonel of the Stealths Regiment. He was given command of the operation, seconded by Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Steiner, the Archon's son and heir. Political squabbling within the Free Wells League gave them the opportunity they had been waiting for, as the Regulan Hazars returned back to their principality, leaving the defence of Bella open. The new garrison had only just arrived on Weld when the attack commenced. Hempstead's signature manoeuvring tactics brought the battle to a swift end in March. In the wake of the battle at Bella, the grizzled stealth veteran was recalled to Tharkad, leaving command to the now brevet colonel Marcus Steiner. Hempstead had impressed the Archon with how he had improved the abilities of the Lyran regulars under his command. Richard Steiner now paired him with a few of the retired mech warriors of the Stealths and Tamar Tigers, and tasked them with doing the same for the 54th Lyran Guards. Back in February, the AWFS took aim at four more worlds belonging to House Kirita, including the Bene system, a pre-war holding of theirs. The slow but steady campaign succeeded in driving them off by November. Meanwhile, the Capellans launched another invasion of Castleton in July. Two months later, the planet was once again flying the banner of House Liao. Paul Davian was tiring of these constant attacks in the region, and so had authorised a new front to be opened within the Cyan and St. Ives commonalities, two regions that had barely seen any fighting during the war. The Certis Fusiliers took point, and by the end of the year had secured six new worlds for the Capellan March. This came at the cost of two regiments, and so further advances were called off. It had done the job though, as Liao would not strike at the Federated Sons again for years. The Commonwealth borders were particularly active throughout 2816. Bella was just one of the systems taken from Marek, as Operation Spiderweb pressed deeper into the Solaris Bulge. 
Their objective was to attack the Duchy of Kalidasa from two sides and cut off any defenders on the capital. Over the next year or two, each of the task forces would take a trio of planets. Maddock was trying to organize a response, but Capellan raids on his spinward flank kept him off balance. On the Curitan front, the Draconis Combine had taken seven worlds from the Commonwealth over the last few years and destroyed another regiment while they were at it. However, Richard Steiner's decision to break up the stealths and send them to the academies was starting to pay dividends. The commanders within the Tamar Pact launched a successful campaign along the border between the Benjamin and Roselhaig military districts, taking seven more systems back in that same period. 2817 would be the penultimate year of the Davian counteroffensive, beginning in March with attacks on Allerton, Courtney, Emporia, and Sauk City. As they drew ever closer to what was considered firm House Kudita territory, the First Prince became more cautious of increased civilian resistance and attacks staged from deeper within the Combine. By September, the four planets had returned to the Federated Suns, and a couple of months later, they made their last moves of the year against Bettendorf, Crossing, and Franklin. Also targeted was Lima across their Starly Gera border, where another of the Galadin Regulars regiments was destroyed. In April, the Free Wells League launched the final offensive of what had once been the Bolan Thumb. The invasion of Kavanagh and Ilion were of secondary note compared to what would be the fifth battle for Bella, not counting the many raids against the planet. Coinciding with the attacks was another raid launched against the capital of Rancher within the Federation of Sky. Two months earlier, Marcus Steiner had received a shipment of tactical nukes on Bella assigning them primarily to his aerospace assets. Additional reinforcements came from one of the last Essex-class destroyers in the Navy. Despite his privileged birth, Marcus was not merely in command because of his name. He had learned well from Colonel Hempstead and was prepared to resist the FWLM. Escorting the three Maddock battle mech regiments to Bella were a pair of Caddocks. Originally envisioned as an armed transport and not a mainline warship, they stood little hope of overcoming the hostile destroyer, something which became readily apparent when the lead vessel disintegrated under the Edelweiss's cannon fire within just two minutes. Recognizing that she was outgunned, Captain Monica Talassi ordered her crew to abandon ship. As they made for the lifeboats, she took the controls and piloted it on a collision course with the Lyran destroyer. Edelweiss evaded too late, and the entire starboard side of the warship was ripped off before a magazine explosion detonated both vessels. With both sides losing their naval support early, the remaining forces were closely matched. The FWLM had strength in numbers, both battle mechs and aerospace fighters, but Steiner's fighters were equipped with tactical warheads which evened the playing field. The Lyran regulars proved to be highly evasive, picking and choosing when to engage in battle only at favourable moments. But the League troops proved equally skilled, and by December, it had become clear that the LCAF would need to withdraw. Casting aside what equipment they couldn't take with them, Marcus and his regulars departed for their jump ships. When the Marrick units moved in to seize their prize, booby traps among the abandoned mechs detonated the remaining nuclear weapons inflicting another two companies of casualties on the victorious Freewells League. This would prove to be the last battle on this part of the front, both sides now turning their attention towards the Solaris Bulge. The Capellan war machine was grinding to a halt at this point in the war. Another of the Capellan charges had succumbed to their losses in 2817, and battlefield attrition meant less than 10% of their regiments could field even two battalions. The planets themselves were suffering from the damage too, as vital environmental systems were either destroyed or broke down due to the lack of replacement parts. To help maintain some of the equipment that was quickly becoming branded as Lost Tech, Liao established the Capellan Science Foundation in 2818. Other similar institutions would appear across the inner sphere in the years and decades to come, but the rampant destruction meant that preserving advanced technology was becoming an ever greater challenge. 
In April, Paul Davian launched the final three planetary liberations of the counter-offensive. Two months later, Marduk, Sheet, and Tripoli were restored to the Federated Suns. With the Draconis Combine pushed more or less back to their pre-war borders, plus a handful of their own worlds taken by Davian for good measure, the First Prince called a halt to the campaign. Pushing the mustard soldiery back became more difficult with each passing year. Continuing the assault risked having nothing left with which to hold on to their reclaimed territory. The war had cost House Curita 20 battle mech regiments on this front alone. The exact date of their destruction is lost to the chaos of the First Succession War, but the vast majority either fell or surrendered post Kintari massacre, making the atrocity the most costly mistake of Jinjiro's reign of terror. By the end of 2818, the Lyran Commonwealth's Operation Spiderweb completed the first phase of their efforts to secure the valuable Solaris system when the two task forces regrouped within the Duchy of Kaladasa on Alks and New Hope, less than three light years away. The Free Worlds League had not laid down and surrendered yet, destroying one of the Donegal Guards and retaking four of the ten systems Halpman General Hogarth had seized. Nevertheless, the encirclement of the provincial capital was now complete. In the new year, the seven remaining regiments would combine to make an overwhelming assault on Kaladasa. As 2819 began, combat activity across the Inner Sphere was in a terminal decline, as exhaustion and lack of equipment became a rampant issue within each of the successor state militaries. In the final five years of the war, only two systems exchanged hands on the Capellan Freewell's border. Tit-for-tat action on Matheran the previous year showed that both sides barely had the strength to hold an objective, and the loss of one of the Confederation's mercenary regiments underlined the reality that House Liao could no longer muster an offensive at this stage. On the opposite side of the Inner Sphere, the Draconis Combine was making the last of its major raiding campaigns against the Lyran Commonwealth targeting Alexandria, Kessel, and Tamar. Another unit was dispatched to the edge, only to discover that the world was completely without garrison, netting Kirita an easy conquest. Other than that, the two realms took just two other systems from each other as the fighting came to a halt. The Federated Sons found itself dangerously overextended along the Combine border, Paul Davian made the difficult decision to withdraw from nine systems he had fought hard to take over the past two decades. Some of these were longtime Curitan holdings with unruly populaces, but others had welcomed the Fed Sun's liberators with open arms. In total, fighting within the occupied territory, both during the initial invasion and the counteroffensive, had resulted in the deaths of more than a billion people. The last major offensive of the First Succession War, Operation Spiderweb, entered its final phase in February 2819. The garrison at Rochelle had been redeployed to the nearby provincial capital, meaning the planet fell to Ranier Hogarth's task force almost immediately. Expecting them to follow the same plodding advance as they had up to this point, the forces on Kaladasa and Solaris struck out in April hoping to liberate some of the wells the Hauptmann General had seized during the advance. As the Matic forces approached their jump ships, Leiden warships entered the system, escorting all seven regiments that had only just taken Rochelle. The Steiner commander had not bothered to wait for reinforcements to secure the planet, and instead banked on their attack catching the Duke of Kaladasa flat-footed, which it did. The system wasn't totally without defense, however, as waiting at the Zenith were the last FWLM warships in the region. By this point in the war, there were barely any surviving shipyards capable of servicing such vessels, and so not one of the warships was fully functional. Only the LCS Chaffee survived the engagement, which also claimed most of the Marek militia who were caught in space. The attack group made landfall nine days later, the surviving garrison surrendering two months after that. With Solaris now totally surrounded, Hogarth enacted his master plan. Instead of dispatching his task force to claim the game world, he sent diplomats. The population was already in unrest, as news filtered in and their situation became clear. However, the last thing Steiner wanted was for the hordes of mech gladiators on planet to take to the field to protect their home. 
Intense urban fighting would surely follow if that happened, leading to widespread destruction. The Lyran diplomats offered the civilian government special status within the Commonwealth as a neutral system under the protection of the LCAF, in exchange for a cut of the planet's profits. After three months of debate, Solaris seceded from the Free Worlds League on September 10th and demanded that the FWLM garrison withdraw by the end of the year. The Maddox commander prepared to seize the capital and enact martial law, but when it became clear that no help would be coming, they reluctantly departed for safer territory. The Lyran Commonwealth moved into their new holding early in the new year. The transition had caused a minimum of disruption, for which the locals were thankful. Operation Spiderweb had been a huge success for Haus Steiner. Reclaiming the Bolan Thumb had removed an ever-present threat to their realm, as well as righting a perceived wrong dating back to before the Star League. But the capture of Kaladasa and Solaris, two enormously wealthy systems that had avoided the worst of the succession wars, was a far greater boon to their economy. Other systems in the region had been less fortunate. Shertan and Uhuru had been reduced to a shadow of their former glory. The Free Worlds League was not above petty retribution, however. In one of the few collaborations between realms in the First Succession War, in 2820, the Red Eagles Mercenary Battalion in the employ of the Draconis Combine was loaned out to the Free Worlds League to hit their shared enemy, the Lyran Commonwealth. Partnering with Clinton's cutthroats, the two units struck at Solaris in March. A reliance on mercenaries for attacks like this was becoming ever more common during the final years of the war, with the Free Worlds also signing on Salasia's defiance that year. The raiders sent to Solaris had come to cause as much destruction as possible, particularly to the water treatment facilities on planet. The two inflicted considerable damage before the garrison was able to organize and force them to depart but as they did so, their warship escort maneuvered overhead to bombard Solaris City from orbit, killing thousands below. The raiding party withdrew soon after. This act of revenge may have hurt the planet's population, but it would ensure that they would never willingly submit to Marak rulership again. Despite the blow to relations between the two states, the reality of the First Succession War was becoming clear to both ruling houses. In late 2820, diplomats convened on Bella and began peace talks. Now hold on just one second there guys, because we're not done yet. This was just the first in a two-part finale, and if I've timed things right, the second one is just about to begin. In fact, if all goes according to plan, YouTube should feed this one straight into the next. If it doesn't, you should be able to click on the channel and see the next one just about to begin. I've not so much to say on this video itself. Everyone involved is pretty much run out of energy. They're struggling to keep going at this stage. The next chapter is going to begin with the very last gasps of the First Succession War before everybody tries to find some way of bringing the conflict to an end. With so much death and destruction, you know it's going to be impossible for things to be permanently put to rest, but things simply cannot go on any longer as they are now. The Lyran Commonwealth, despite being the slowest out of the gates at the start of this conflict, has really done the best in the latter kind of decade or two. Operation Spiderweb went great for them, uh, they successfully reclaimed a good two-thirds of the Bolan Thumb, and now they're turning things around on the Curitan front as well. But I don't really want to say that things are looking up for them, because the people in that realm are still suffering just as much as everywhere else. Davian also has completed his remarkable turnaround from being only one battle away from having their entire realm collapse, to pushing Kirita all the way back to their kind of starting line. Pretty incredible. In fact, you might say it almost stretches credibility. Let's just say there's a reason people often claim that Davian was the favourite of the early authors. Anyway, like I say, the next one's due in just a couple of minutes now. Before you go, remember to leave a like, comment on the video if you want. I'll try my best to reply to as many people as I can. But I'll hope to see you again soon in just a few moments for the finale of the First Succession War. Peace for our time.